Ladies and gentlemen, we'll, uh, we'll start. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to project their voices as loudly as this because we're competing with what's outside. And of course, so many people want to come and hear what these guys have got to say that, that the crowds are standing outside of the room, which is fantastic. Um, look, let, let's get an idea of the scale of the challenge. In Glasgow at COP26, the UK committed to a 68% reduction in emissions in the next eight years. That's by 2030, so actually it's really seven years now. Housing and the built environment, they make up 25% of all the UK emissions. So we will not meet that 68% target in emissions reductions unless we tackle the sustainability of the built environment. That's not just housing, it's all the built environment, but particularly housing. And there's a huge challenge. So today, what do we have? We've got EPCs that tell you basically how leaky and poorly insulated your home is. Um, A, that stands for absolutely great. G, that stands for god awful. And F, I'm not even going to go there. Um, so all new homes should be being built to standard A. But they're not. But they're not. Why? We also have the BRIAM, the BRIAM standards. Uh, who knows what BRIAM stands for? Mm, okay. Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method. Really good. Really good. Um, and there's three elements, the building itself and its performance, the building management performance, that's the, the way we use it, the consumption of, of key resource energies, water, waste management, etc., and the organizational effectiveness of those using it. So that's not whether you've got a double flush toilet, it's whether you've told the people who are using the toilet always to press the small button instead of the big button, okay? Currently, the Environmental Audit Committee has been pressing the government to insist upon whole life carbon assessments to establish carbon emissions embodied in the building itself. Because incredibly, there is no government requirement to assess or control those embodied emissions. Other countries do it, and actually even some local authorities are doing it and, and introducing that as part of their planning process. Um, but in the UK as a whole, we're not. So, the future home standard, <laughs> it won't come into effect until 2025. The construction industry needs certainty, it needs confidence. I'm sure we're going to get that from the other end of the table when we eventually get down there. And they want to get on with it. We should be doing this, have those standards in place by 2023. Um, skills. Do we have the skills to do it? No, we don't. And if we don't have the skills to do it, there's no point in setting the bloody targets in the first place. You've actually got to train people up. You've got to have the apprenticeships in place. You've got to be doing it. There is so much, so much, when we're talking about sustainability and affordable housing, okay? And that's just the sustainability side. So we've got an amazing panel today. They, they represent just about every every aspect of this that we could hope for. Um, I'm going to start off with Dan. You all know Dan Norris, Metro Mayor of the West of England, uh, good colleague in Parliament, as was. And um, Dan, you have the regional challenges of doing this. Tell us what your experience is. Tell us how you're doing it. Thank you very much, Barry, and, and welcome everybody. Lovely to see you. I'm going to try and project because it's a difficult room for you to hear in and for us to speak in, but shout if you can't hear. Now, what you probably aren't aware is the west of England covers Bristol and Bath primarily, parts of South Gloucestershire, parts of North East Somerset, a uh, population of over a million. Um, we have only built, been able to build, despite Labour's efforts, just over a thousand, 1,061 homes, affordable homes in a year. That is not going to meet the needs of that large populace, clearly. We also have a quarter of a million homes that are leaky, that are not up to standard in terms of insulation. So you can imagine why that is, because we've got like Bath uh, with its very grand homes, not designed with insulation in mind. The issue wasn't even considered when those homes were largely built. 
because there are lots of white lawyers, for those who know, stone cottages, again, not you know, gap for insulation or anything like that. So there's a real challenge. Uh, and the thing that we need to do is to have Metro Mayors who have powers who can actually make a difference to that. Because what we have is a great Metro Mayor, or yeah, Metro Mayor in London, in Sadiq Khan, with significant powers, voted for by Barry and I when we created that, so that they could get on with a job that was vitally needed to do. And then we got the Tories creating a whole series of other Metro Mayors outside London, but not giving the powers that are necessary, many of the responsibilities, but not necessarily the powers. So the Labour government is going to have to come up with giving us the powers to be able to make a difference. Uh, because at the moment, I have a situation where I have three councils in my area. One of them is Labour, one of them is Lib Dem, and one of them is Tory. Uh, in order to get many things through, I have to have a unanimous vote. So I have to get the agreement of everybody. Well, the Labour one is pretty taken for granted, but the other two is not. Uh, and it's a bit like having a Prime Minister who needs to get the Scottish First Minister, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Welsh Assembly to vote for everything they're going to do. Clearly not manageable. And it's because the devolution that was created by, um, what was his name? Uh, the Chancellor, it was the Chancellor, the Tory Chancellor, think about it. with Cal Osborne, that's the guy I'm trying to think. I can't think why I can't remember him. Um, he basically wanted to create them, but he didn't kind of, do it properly. What he wanted to do was just get it sort of semi set up and then worry about how you got the details later. The trouble is those details haven't improved. So what we've got is responsibility and created a devolution that took powers away from unitary authorities and local authorities, but didn't give us power from Westminster, which is the powers we need just like Sadiq has got. So that is critically important. Now, what I'm really, really keen to tell you is if we are going to meet those housing needs, both in terms of sustainability and meeting homelessness, you know, getting rid of homelessness and meeting the needs of first-time buyers and others, we need a Labour government to provide that money. The market will not be able to do that in the short term quickly enough. And it's such an issue, we have got to get on with it. Frankly. So we have to talk about that a lot. We have to make sure that we've got plans for that that are robust and solid. It's a great investment. You've got to make sure that homes are not just affordable to buy, whatever affordable means these days, who knows, but affordable to run. Because it's no good if you've got a home and you can't put the heating on because it's so damn expensive and it's all going out through the windows or the roof. So that is clearly very, very important. Now, where we have been successful here in the West of England region is we've been able to secure about 100 million towards something called the Temple Quarter Development. For those of you who know Bristol and, and the surrounding areas, it's near Temple Mead Station because it's, it's that area. And that's very exciting. We're going to build lots of new homes, many of them affordable. That is great. But it's just a drop in the ocean to what the region needs. Uh, and the way that we got that money was by bidding to this Conservative government against other parts of the country also in great need. That is not an acceptable way to run affairs. The need is too important. Now, we can't be surprised because we've heard all this nonsense, haven't we, about bankers' bonuses. We know where um, the class system is, is at being effectively carried out, we can see that people are not seen as equal or the same. Some people are seen as more valuable to the Tories, and that happens to be the very rich people. And the people who actually produce the wealth, which is to have good health uh, and good conditions in order to, to live in, uh, are being ignored. And we have to change that. And I'm afraid, Barry, I'm looking to you and all our Labour colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet to do a great job to get those policies there, to look credible, because I, I have to say that uh, my experience of working with Barry and, and other great comrades from the past in Parliament is that we have to look the part as well as have the policies, uh, and that is not something that is easy to do. Um, and we do need to do that because we have to make sure that in this media age where people have very little span of attention and also where people have huge responsibilities, whether that's elder care or childcare, we've got to grab them very quickly and indicate to them that we are a government in waiting, that we are people who can make the difficult calls that they can trust. So we've got a lot of work to do. I tell you one thing, I'm really pleased to see the optimism here at conference, and it's lovely to see, but let me caution, and, and I don't want to be a small sport here, but we mustn't be complacent. Winning is not just about the Tories messing up, um, it's about us being ready. And I feel it's like a dam at the moment. The water level is getting higher and higher and higher. It's gonna break, and when it breaks, it happens very, very quickly. Uh, and when it does, we have got to be ready. 
So you've got to make sure that the environment is so there's full. You've got to make sure that we actually build houses and have a funding mechanism to do that quickly while we get <coughs> proper systems in so that the market can work towards that. And we've got to make sure that we are competent and have good policies. If we do that, I'm confident we will have a Labour government, but much more importantly than that, will make the difference to the people we care about. And that's what it's all about. We're in politics for a reason, and that's the reason. Thank you. Dan, and Dan, I know you've got to go. Before you go, um, you, you've set us key things, powers, funding mechanisms, make sure we've got the policies in place. That's great. Um, procurement. Procurement is something that you do have the power as, as the West of England Authority. Are you using that to drive demand for low carbon industrial products, to insist on whole life carbon assessments for all public works? Um, is that something that you are already dealing with at that local level? We are already on it, but what I want you to know is that our Labour Metro Mayors are working together. Because what we want to do is show a, sort of the dividing lines between the Tory government in power and Labour in power, which is predominantly through Metro Mayors at the moment. And we want to be able to say, look, this is what the Tory government's done, and this is what Labour in power has done, so we can have those nice contrasts to show what the difference is because the Tories are very skilled at blurring everything. That's what Boris Johnson is about. Boris Johnson is a blurrer. He doesn't want anybody to have a clear choice. What he wants to make it is confusing and difficult, and then he does his bluster, bluster and his super confident stuff. Now we've got Liz Trust with, well, who knows what's going on at the moment. But what I tell you, is we mustn't over rely on the Tories messing up, because I think they're so ruthless. I, you know, Barry, I, many of you in here know what the Tories are about. They're opportunists. Uh, and they will, if they can get some kind of poll bounce, even though it's madness they're suggesting, if they see a poll advantage, they'll go to the country. So we've got to be ready. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dan. Bye. Cheers. I'm delighted delighted now to, to introduce Nashaba. She's the Shadow Cabinet Member for Habering and Medway and former parliamentary candidate for Rochester and Stroud. So tell me what you're doing locally and oh, how it's going. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barry. And I will try to project my voice, but it is um, <coughs> the third day of conference, I think, for me. So um, apologies if you can't quite hear me. Um, so really good to hear from Dan and some of the things that he was talking about there as a Metro Mayor. As a councillor who is in opposition in a Tory council, we're looking to take it next year, hopefully. Um, but as a councillor in opposition, I'm seeing firsthand some of the big challenges we're facing when it comes to affordable housing. But not only that, the need for affordable, sustainable housing is more important than ever. And we've talked a bit about the climate crisis and how, you know, our emissions as a country and what we need to do to be tackling and challenging those and how reform and a review of our sustainable housing and how we deliver housing in this country is a fundamental part of that. For me, as someone that is representing some of the most deprived, one of the most deprived wards in the country, what I also think that this will help us to do is to, first of all, challenge the overcrowding that I see in, in my area, um, but also start to look at affordability levels. And uh, Dan touched upon it when he spoke in his speech about how, you know, it's not just about building affordable homes to buy or live in, it's about ensuring that you're not then losing your money through the windows um, when you're trying to heat up your house. And obviously we're seeing the challenges now with energy bills and an energy crisis. And actually even before this current crisis started, 10% of households in the UK were living in, in fuel poverty. So this is not a new problem, it is a growing problem. Um, and it is really starting to impact on our community. So I think this is so, so important that we push this agenda forward. I think from a local government perspective, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, there are some things that have happened that are making this a bit easier. The lifting of the HRA cap and allowing to borrow so that councils can build homes has been an important part of this. And I know for a fact that Medway Council, where I'm a, a, a councillor, we are now able to start building social housing and we are doing it um, in a sustainable manner and ensuring that is a fundamental part of our delivery. But the reality is, it's not really happening fast enough or enough. You know, at most, we're delivering three or four homes in particular areas. And I think there is a big contrast 
between what happens in London and what happens as soon as you step outside of that M25 border. And I think that's something we've really got to think about because we do not have those land values or the ability to really <coughs> challenge developers or even as councils have that funding to be able to deliver the level of housing that we need. And I think that often that, you know, when we compare the major cities in this country and we look at London, I think sometimes that can skew what's happening on the ground in places like Medway, which is in Kent, but has really high levels of deprivation and really and a, and a huge housing need. So I do think we need to remember that and keep that in perspective when we have this conversation. I think there are some things that councils can absolutely be doing and councils should absolutely be doing. The first thing is sustainability needs to be within our local planning processes. It needs to be part of our local plan and it needs to be embedded. It cannot be an afterthought. It's got to be something that from the start of the process that we are ensuring is, is, is it, you know, we are thinking about it right from the beginning, not right at the end once consent has been granted, but right at the beginning. So that's one thing. I think another way is to look at different delivery of homes and how we can deliver housing. So modular housing, for example, you can deliver modular housing relatively quickly. And what that means is that you know, it has a better impact on the environment um, and you can do things in a way that are more sustainable. So again, looking at those sorts of types of different delivery models is important. Um, equally, when we're looking at our infrastructure, and again, I think we do need to think about this carefully because it works differently in cities than it does in places outside of those main hubs but we do we can think about how we can ensure that our infrastructure is better suited to public transport than it is to car usage and again some of those um, and again ensuring that happens from the beginning of the process will help us to deliver and finally green infrastructure and what that means we all know that particularly since the COVID pandemic accessing green spaces is fundamentally important it's much better for mental health and it also helps us with emissions so being able to ensure that that is embedded in our policy is, is a really important part of this. But I wanted to end just to highlight some of the challenges that we face in local government when it comes to this. And I know I touched on it at the beginning. Um, we've, of course, we've touched upon the fact that we're missing targets continually, both at a local government level. I know that we never meet our affordable housing delivery targets in Medway, but also nationally, we're missing those housing targets year on year. And the housing numbers change continuously the, the, you know, the, the ask from national government, depending on who's leader, who, who is the Minister for Housing, it changes. To be honest, the number is almost irrelevant because we're not even getting close to it. So you can add an extra thousand on if you want, but we've not even started to deliver anywhere near the amount that we should be. So we've got to really look at what's causing that delay. Uh, I think in the current situation that we're in, the one thing we can't remember, forget which I think will have an impact on both delivery, but also how sustainable the homes are that we deliver, is the cost of building. So not only materials, but the cost of labour. And what that means is that it's probably going to be easier if we want to build cheaply to use, rely on materials that are less sustainable. And that is a problem. So the cost, the pure cost of delivery, I think is a big challenge. It's starting to happen. We're starting to see it increasingly in, in our local authorities, but also increasingly across the piece. And I think it's one of those things that in a year's time, we'll really look back and say how, you know, this is something we've got to address. So um, just a bit of a red flag there. Um, and then finally, just the impact on, on councils in terms of planning departments. Our planning department has been cut to the bone. <laughs> it is not able to either give the level of scrutiny that it should to planning applications, nor is it able to provide the level of support it should to um, developers who are bringing forward, forward applications and it is just struggling to deliver. And at the same time, it's trying to deliver a local plan, which is, you know, has been through about five different iterations and still is nowhere near being adopted. So these are some of the major challenges that local authorities are facing. So it's all very well having high target and talking about sustainability, but unless we can deliver that on the ground, it's almost a moot point. And we've really got to start to look at what is clogging up the system and why we can't not only get affordable homes, but sustainable affordable homes on the ground. Great. <laughs> Mushaba, thanks so much. Thanks for addressing the, the affordability, the HRA cap. Uh, significant, I think, that you talked about effectively land values. And there's a real challenge for, for Labour to look at land tax potentially. Why is it there's such an uplift between 
agricultural land and development land and who gets the benefit of that. You know, 6,000 institutions, 6,000 individuals in this country, six, yes, 600,000 individuals in this country own 60% of the land of the UK. Um, it's, it's, it's really scary. Um, planning department, council funding, all really important and design right at the beginning, modular design as well, really important aspects of, of, of doing this. <coughs> Delighted we go from Metro Mayor to, to uh, London Mayor, well not, Lon not London Mayor, but local, but authority. local authority <laughs> in London Mayor, uh, Rakshana, uh, Mayor of Newham, uh, tell us your experience and, and what you're doing there. All right, super. I'm going to stand up and hopefully that's going to help project my voice. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right. Brilliant. So I'm Roxana and I'm the directly elected mayor of Newham. I was elected first time round just over four years ago in May 2018 with a promise to certainly on our part as uh, an authority led by an administration with an ambitious uh, tackling poverty inequality agenda, uh, getting to grips with the housing crisis facing our people that we would embark on a radical program of municipal housing delivery. And I'm gonna come back to the point of radical in the context of the scale of what we are facing in Newham, which is uh, a significant local authority with a growing population. It has the fourth largest population growth since the 2021 census and we have a population of over 375,000 people and growing. We have a population profile of some 38% of our resident population being under the age of 24. Uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, we will have more under 24 year olds than we will have over 24 year olds. And given the constraints of buying a home, we have a growing uh, cohort of young generation of Newham residents that can't even think about buying their own home. So it will, will be an indelible feature of generation rent. 58% of our, no, 68% of our resident population live in the private rented sector. The majority of the homes that are being rented uh, have been bought uh, on the basis of buy to let by landlords that don't live in our borough and do not have an investment in the future sustainability of our place and our communities. We have a situation where we are at the coal face of a housing crisis. If you take into account rents, the majority of our households, our people, are defined as living in poverty. Sustainable housing is also a cost of living <coughs> crisis issue requiring a response. Not only do we need to respond to the climate emergency through housing delivery, both through municipal housing delivery, and when I talk about municipal housing delivery, I mean homes that are genuinely affordable at social rent or at London living rent. And I also mean a mobilisation and the marshalling of all the effort of a council through our regeneration department and our housing delivery company, Poplo Living. When I came into office in 2018, and I am privileged enough to have been re-elected in May 2022, I announced that we would embark on a municipal house driving programme of 1,000 homes at social rent, which is just a drop in the ocean given the scale of housing pressure facing us. We have more households living in temporary accommodation than the entirety of the North of England combined. We have more young people in these households, seven and a half thousand and growing, living in temporary accommodation. We have had a contraction of housing supply in the last 12 months in Newham of 47%, the largest contraction of housing supply anywhere in the capital. 
our emergency accommodation budget is really struggling. We are going to need to reconfigure our budget in order to respond to the crisis in housing facing our people. On the private sector side of stuff, we absolutely need to be exploring and embracing land tax. We absolutely need to be pursuing rent caps in the capital and this is something that we are uh, endorsing, something that the Mayor of London has been advocating. And we also need to make sure that of the 44,000 homes of that old Wardian Victorian type that make up our private rented sector, of which 1,217 are owned by the council, these are the most leaky, energy inefficient homes in our borough. And if we were able to draw down on resource, not through our HRA or more and more borrowing, but through resource from national government to encourage viable retrofit by landlords who are profiteering by renting their properties that they've bought to let to our residents. To retrofit those homes, we will go a significant way towards our carbon neutral target for 2030 <laughs> and carbon zero by 2045. Of these 44,000 Victorian Edwardian homes, they currently have an EPC rating of D&E. If you compare that with some of the new homes that we're building as a municipality in Newham, in Stratford, which achieve an EPC rating of A, it just goes to show how stark the difference is. And do you know how much? That new built home that the council is delivering for its people, drawing down on the Public Works Loan Board and <coughs> dipping into our HRA account to the tune of £2 billion pounds of borrowing, which we are going to have to pay back. Our brand new energy efficient homes that we are delivering will save our residents £2,000 a year in energy bills. That's what's at stake. So, there are a range of opportunities. The opportunity is a response to the immediate cost of living crisis that will be enduring for at least five years to help our residents in amongst the most impoverished and deprived communities in this country. But the opportunity is also in response to delivering our climate action for the future of this planet and humanity and our people. And in terms of the challenges, we need more money and we need teeth to show the private sector that you cannot turn a blind eye to this. Because we do not have the luxury of money to be able to deliver more and more homes, notwithstanding the points that have been made about the inefficacies of the planning system or the constraints. But we need a much more forceful interventionist response to ensuring that housing delivery in this country, not only is it scaled up, not only is it led by local authorities like Newham, like Medway, like elsewhere, that we're able to unlock the HRA, that we're able to access more low cost borrowing, but we need grants, we need rent caps, and we need land tax. But the challenge that we will need to all collectively face is dealing with the existential threat that humanity faces. And us here in Newham and at Labour Party conference in Liverpool, we've got to show the country that we have got a prospective that we can take to the country to elect a Labour government so that we can deliver on this sustainable green efficient response to the cost of living and climate emergency crisis that we're all facing. Thank you. Roxana, thanks so much. Um, really important. I mean, you set it out so clearly that sustainability environmentally means sustainability economically for people living there. And, and that actually is 
fundamental to the, this whole discussion. Really good that you touched on the buy to let. Uh, you know, if we were to put NI, national insurance, onto the income that landlords get, which of course is not subject to NI uh, and other non-employment income, that would be 13 billion pounds into the exchequer every single year. These are the sort of imaginative taxation policies that not looking always at income, but looking at wealth and saying, how do we do this better? How do we make sure that that money is available to meet the challenges that you're talking about in local authorities? Great. Love what you said on rent caps as well. Um, really good stuff about municipal delivery. So um, I'm going to jump, I think, uh, Rob, over you. Okay. And I'm going to leave you to the end uh, because I'm saving the best till last. Okay. <laughs> and not that that is any disrespect to Mike Reader, who is, uh, uh, who's jumped onto this panel at the last minute, who wasn't in your, in your briefing note beforehand as one of the people. But Mike from Mace telling us what it's like to actually construct homes and what you see the future challenges in the construction industry to doing it properly. So uh, good afternoon everyone and having heard Rob speak this morning you're in for a treat as the final speaker because uh, he certainly inspired me this morning and what a greenhouse it like. Um, so I'm Mike Reader, I'm Director at MACE and I'm also Chief Operating Officer of an organisation called the Association of Postal Management Professionals. So we are the 12,000 pen pushers and file form fillers that Angela Rayner called out in her speech yesterday as the villains in the procurement space. Um, I want to talk around the challenge, how we as industry can work better with government and particularly with the Labour government. Um, what progressive councils are doing to address the challenge. Councils like Newham, and I'm very fortunate to be a former resident of Newham and see the amazing work that Roxana and the team are doing. Did you vote for her? I did. I was even on that campaign team. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, uh, what you know, picking up on Angela's speech yesterday, this focus on localism is going to be so important to delivering sustainable, affordable, low carbon homes. <coughs> so the challenge we face is, as an industry is is multifaceted, but one big thing that we face is a lack of vision, and that's what the Labour Party brings. We've had industrial strategies, construction strategies, and plans, and 10-point plans. We've had playbooks. We've had all sorts of ideas. And over 12 years, none of them have ever stuck. The construction minister, the housing minister, it's a rotating door. As industry, we're constantly dealing with new people, with new ideas, new vision. And we don't see those things stick. So from a lane of government, we need a vision for the long term. And I'm very pleased to see that it's coming forward over conference. Uh, today. We're very fortunate my CEO Mark Reynolds chairs the Construction Leadership Council and we spent a lot of time with government trying to get them to understand the challenge and the scale of the challenge that we face, not only in relation to skills, every industry is facing a skill shortage, but also our local supply chains and material supply chains and also the local technology supply chains that we'll now need to deliver smart, low carbon, safe homes. Retrofit, I want, to t I want to focus on specifically. Rob, I'm sure we'll talk about the great work they can do in terms of new build, but retrofit is a massive challenge that we face as the UK. And actually, arguably, it's less commercially attractive to developers and organisations, but provides great opportunities to improve the lives of people, often in which are either in the rented sector or living in overcrowded houses. We've seen progressive councils we work with, Devon, Devon County Council, I think, out particularly who are using their funds to address fuel poverty by doing fabric first upgrades. Now what that means is you'll hear a lot of, of, a lot of excitement around things like heat pumps and technology, but actually if we can stop leaking houses, we can stop drafts, we can insulate them properly, fab focus on the fabric first, sort out people's roofs, that makes a massive difference, not only to people, the money in people's pockets, but also the sustainability of the housing stock we have both in the public sector and the private sector. And we're seeing now that being taken seriously. So as MACE, we're doing some studies with both energy hubs and one of the 
uh, governments in the UK than the, the English government to look at what that supply chain needs to look like. And the scary thing is, it's not there. It's delivered a radical, progressive change that we need to fix people's houses. But the UK supply chain is simply not there. And that's a big, big challenge that we face now in delivering any complex and uh, grand vision from either Labour or the current government. But I say it's a positive market opportunity. The construction industry has a skill shortage particularly, and in the consulting world where I work, uh, we have a big shortage of traditional skills like quality surveyors and project managers. But actually, focusing on low carbon and focusing on sustainable housing drives us to a more digital solution. My colleague at the end of the panel talked about modular homes as a potential solution. We are unfortunately seeing modular house building factories closing across the UK as house builders are unfortunately reverting back to water intensive, carbon intensive housing, housing construction methodologies which don't deliver lower body carbon in our housing sector. So we need a government that pushes modular, that pushes digital construction as a key skill in the future uh, and looks to use the whole breadth of the UK economy to help address this housing crisis. So I'll end on, and I'll pass over to Rob, on um, reflecting on Angela's speech yesterday, because after I took the shot of being a, the awful form filler, <coughs> the battles and, and deals with the challenges of a myriad of procurement models and commercial arrangements, and a very complex and overworked and scared public sector that just wants to do a deal and get a deal, but is so afraid of legal challenge, planning challenge, and the cost of engaging the right skills to deliver what they need to deliver. I was really positive to hear that Labour is going to promote localism at the heart of their procurement policy. That's something that we've seen work really well in the Midlands where I live. It's an organisation called Escape of Public Procurement Body, and they have championed localism in their construction supply chains. It's made such a difference to apprenticeships, development of local and niche skills, but also in terms of sustainability, the topic of today's discussion, reducing the embodied carbon in the supply chains we have as we transport materials and labour and capabilities around the country. So if we can take away from today, sustainable housing has to be supported by a focus on localism. That's how we make it sustainable for the long term. And uh, I'm very appreciative that Labour's made that part of their firm policy moving forward. Great, Mike, thanks so much. Really important that, uh, that call for localism. <laughs> and I think also the other thing that I, I really would like to pick out and, and maybe, I don't know, if you can pick up on this, Rob, but but the whole way in which the infrastructure has to be got right. Mike spoke about the supply chains, but he also touched on the infrastructure. We're looking at the ways in which the national grid will have to change, how that's going to affect how you in the industry, in the construction industry, are interacting with all of the infrastructure to make sure that the sustainability is is really there embedded in the planning stage, as well as in the construction stage. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Um, so I, I come from a different angle in terms of I am the, the bad developer, the, the, the house builder. Um, but hopefully a house builder with a different view. And that is that we, we build two things. We build private housing to start with. And on every scheme we've ever delivered, we've always been policy compliant in affordable housing. Our affordable housing has been tenure blind and it's always pepper potted amongst the private housing, completely mixed. Which I think is hugely important for a cohesive society and not creating a two-tier society on day one. The second thing that we do is we build for councils and housing associations. And indeed, over 50% of our build is for our councils and our housing association clients. <coughs> and there we start to, to, to lead on our, our, our USP, really, which is our, our zero carbon, net zero work. We set out back at the start of 2020 that every home we deliver would be net zero in lifetime use from the 1st of January 2025 onwards. Um, five years older than any of any size in this country. Five years sooner than anybody else um, of any size in this country. We also set out that we would be carbon neutral in production. And it's generally accepted we've done more work than anybody else with regards to the embodiment of carbon in construction as well. And indeed, we let you into to, to, to DLUT, to DEFRA, and to BASE on that as the two. Thirdly, we, we also are looking at zero carbon placemaking, because actually whilst housing is hugely important and the carbon footprint of housing is hugely important, 
actually we can affect the way people live. We can affect the way they move around. Non-carbon based transport, public transport, etc, etc. More cycle, more pedestrian access. And actually transport movements account for 25% of our carbon footprint in the UK. And finally, we set out that we would, we would deliver 20% biodiversity net gain across all, all of our developments. Twice what the government's previously set out by 2025 as well. And indeed, indeed we're achieving over 40% of some of our schemes now. And that is by being led by a landscape-led approach, changing the way we do things, looking at the natural environment first, and all of our schemes are now led by a landscape architect, and the traditional architect comes in behind. But we've done a few other things differently as well. We've spent two years working lots of county council looking at how good community creation and good, good development addresses social and health inequality. And perhaps that's a different angle from a house builder or a private developer. The lessons that we learn from the way we get people to interact, the way we cohesively join those communities, the way that we absolutely deliver zero carbon, because it is about addressing fuel poverty. You know, net zero, lifetime use, no household bill for heating your home. Surely, you know, 25% of the housing in this country is yet to be delivered that will, will exist in 2050. Why is every home we deliver from now onwards not zero carbon? Absolutely. I cannot yeah. understand that. I really can't. We, we have the technology, we have the ability. Well, whatever, we, we have the technology, we have the ability, we should be doing it. You know, and, and I think for me it's a real no-brainer and I struggle with that. Um, I think, you know, we've led as a business with the, with the Future Homes Task Force, the Future Homes Hub, about our journey towards net zero. There are huge lessons that we can learn from that and we need to get that across the industry. We're working with our, um, our partners, our housing association partners, to look at the lessons we're learning on the new build to try and translate that back to the retrofits now as well. You know, and the retrofit is a huge, huge challenge, particularly affording it in the affordable sector. You know, but it's something we have to address. You know, we have an, an opportunity to address fuel poverty. We have a, a, an opportunity to make people's lives better in the places that we create and how they interact. And, 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 and as I say, given that 25% of the housing we've delivered by 2050 is yet to be built, surely we have an obligation to design those places well, to build them well, and to make sure they're net zero. And, and from our point of view, that's cornerstones to our agenda at Faith. With regards to the, the challenges around the supply chain, and, and around energy particularly, you know, I think it is hugely. I, I struggle with the fact that, you know, why aren't we delivering every home we, we, we build with, with solar panels, etc., on the roof? Why, when we've got a development, aren't they taken back locally to a battery park and then we feed them back across the development to flatten that supply and make it most efficient and then feed the excess into the grid? You know, we can have power stations up and down the country in housing estates, but we, we, we can't join that dot either. And then, of course, water neutrality, the other issues around that, we can look about how we harvest water, how we store water and how we behave with water as well. So, you know, I'm right at the front of that and pushing hard. So, yes, different perspective, perhaps, from my, many of my contemporaries and colleagues in my sector. <laughs> Rob, Rob, that was uh, magisterial, uh, uh, and I think you've really spoken to the audience now.